do. I, I was a practicing dentist for 38 years. Um, I still am a partial owner of a practice in Burton, but I no longer practice. I sold my practice, my original practice in Plymouth, Plymouth, Michigan, to my associate uh, four years ago. Um, we're still on very good terms. I'm still in my office quite frequently, my old office. You can see it, my Freudian slip there. But I'm still in my old office quite frequently. But these days, I'm focused almost entirely on practice management, practice consulting. I still do a lot of transition, you know, buying and selling of dental practice consulting. But I've also done a fair amount over the years and doing more and more of practice consulting over specific issues with regard to practices. One of the major um, issues that are now becoming more to the forefront is the profitability of the dental practice. How can a practice be profitable? All of you out there know, um, if you're in dentistry for any period of time, that the challenges facing dentistry are increasing, um, both from the standpoint of uh, physically doing the dentistry, we're asked, you're being asked today to do more dentistry in a shorter period of time and still maintain the quality of it, but also to do it in a way that's profitable. And hopefully you can take some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today and use those in your own individual practice to determine that profitability or help that profitability would be a better word. Um, a quick word before we get started. I'm going to give you a lot of numbers today, a lot of guidelines to use when you determine your profitability and, and your expenses within your um, a given practice. Understand, those are just guidelines. That's not meant as the end-all be-all. The, the guidelines I'm going to give you are the product of my own experience, as well as many practice management groups, what they use as their numbers, as well as um, just a general feeling within the profession. But they're just guidelines. They're the start of the discussion. They're the start of the evaluation of your own practice. They're not the end. So if you fall outside these particular guidelines that I give you, don't, don't worry too much. Where I see problems are, and a little spoiler alert here, one of the things I'm going to tell you is, is that I think you should be profiting. There should be about 40% profit uh, for every dollar that you bring into your practice. So if you bring a dollar into your practice, about 40% of that should be profit. If you fall below that, um, if you first of all, if you fall above that, great, good job. You know, that's wonderful. If you fall below that, uh, you know, it's something that you should look at, something you should consider. It's not typically the end of the world if you're at 38 cents on a dollar or 35 cents on the dollar. When I see problems, when I go into consult with practices, the problem is, is that it's 20 cents on the dollar or 11 cents on the so the, the numbers are guidelines. They're not meant as an end-all, be-all. So I'm going to start this um, entire process with a story. And you'll see today I have a lot of stories. Uh, I'm unfortunately, one of those people that tends to uh, have a lot of experiences. I almost have a story for every situation. But let's start with what I like to call the, the, the I don't know saga. This occurred in 2014. And I was asked by a dentist to come in and help him in the, in the practice because he said, I just got this feeling that things aren't quite right in my practice. I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you why, but I just have this, this nagging feeling. So we started talking and I, I asked him, well, what, what's going on? What, do you, what makes you feel uncertain? He said, you know, I've always had the evaluation criteria for my practice of that at the end of the month, I write myself a $15,000 paycheck. And again, numbers aren't important, but the concept is a $15,000 paycheck, pay all the bills. And as long as I have money left over in my checking account, I'm doing fine. Now, you don't need to be, uh, you know, a member of the Federal Reserve in a CPA capacity to know that's not a good evaluation criteria, but that was his. And I said, okay, that's fine, but, but what, what's happening? Why is it now you think you're having a problem? He said, you know, he said, occasionally now I have to drag a bill and, you know, I can't make the, you know, the, the, the supply bill payment on time and I'd have to drag that for a couple of weeks. And I said, well, you know, that, that's an issue, obviously. It's, it's something you should be aware of. I said, there's got to be more to this. And then he let the cat out of the bag. The real um crux of the issue became known. He said, you know, in 2011, I sold my vacation home in Charlevoix, and I sold it for $450,000, and I put that into my office account, and you know what? Everything was fine for a couple of years. I mean, I may have made a 
payments. I can take my hundred fifty, you know, my fifteen thousand dollar a month, you know, payroll check. Everything was great. He says, and then last year we started getting a little, little more problems, and, and I wasn't being able to meet all my obligations and all the bills. So I sold a couple of boats. I sold a ski boat and a fishing boat, and I put that hundred fifty thousand dollars in my bank account. And, you know, and we're still having problems. He said, it dawned on me that. Maybe the fact that I was pouring all this money into the bank account signified that we had a problem. And those of you out there, I can't see you face to face, but I'm sure a lot of you are chuckling and, and probably laughing and saying, what is wrong with this guy? Why didn't he know he had a problem? But again, he didn't know he had, had a problem because he wasn't tracking his numbers. The obvious fact that he had to pour money in was a big issue, but he wasn't tracking his numbers. When I asked him, how much are you producing? What are you collecting in a year? Said, I don't know. I said, you don't know at all? He said, no. I said, are you collecting 500000 a year? Are you collecting a million a year? He said, I have no idea. I said, how much money did you make last year? He said, I don't know. I said, how are your expenses? You know, How are your supply costs? He said, I don't know. Clearly, to the 10 or 15 questions I asked him, his answer was, I don't know. And that was the reason that he was having a problem. Not because of the numbers themselves, but because he didn't know. That's why it's important to know your financials when you start talking about the profitability of your practice. So my goals for you today are, I really have four main ones. And the first one is, I want you to know why it's important to know your financials. Hopefully the story I just told you starts that process of knowing why it's important. But um, hopefully I'll even expand upon that as we go. Number two goal for me for you is to know what your financials should be which financials in your particular office should, you should be tracking? Because it's going to vary depending upon the type of office. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. Number three, I want you to know what your individual numbers mean when it comes to determining the health of your individual practice. Again, different practices are going to have different norms. I'm going to give you my overall norms, but their different practices are going to have different norms about what you should be tracking. And number four, I want you to know what to do with your health report. And I call the health report um, your numbers. Once you have your numbers, what you should do with it. All right, before we start talking about specific numbers, there's several rules you should know when you're talking about financials. Financials are really just numbers. And, and, and numbers are, don't lie. Numbers are just numbers. They're not necessarily good or bad. If they're compiled honestly or correctly, they're going to tell you how you're doing is just like your blood pressure. Your blood pressure is your blood pressure. You can't, if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, or let's take that different, let's say your blood pressure is 140 over 100, you can't say, um, you can't lie about it and say it's one, yeah, I guess you could, but you can't say it's 110 over uh, 70. Um, numbers are what they are. They're honest. They, if they're compiled correctly, they're going to tell you that, hey, if your blood pressure is 140 over 100, it's something you got to look at. It, it, it's, it's an objective nature, an objective measurement of how you're doing. Number three, don't be intimidated by numbers, whether they're good or bad. A lot of times, particularly when I talk to staff members about this, they're very worried that they're going to track a number that's going to reflect poorly on them. I'm going to talk a little more later, but you're going to see that largely when I see problems, they're not due to staff members. There's a very famous uh, efficiency expert, if you will, and some of you may have heard, but it's more from my generation, a, a fellow named Peter Drucker, who was largely responsible for helping Japan out of World War II to, to get back on track. And what Peter Drucker said, and I firmly believe this, is there's no really bad team members. And he gave me sort of team members. There's really no bad employees. There's really only bad systems. So when numbers aren't what they should be, most of the time, and I've got to say that I subscribe to this 100%, it's not that there's bad people instituting the system. It's there's bad systems that result in bad numbers. So when you're tracking them, don't be worried about whether they're bad or they're good. Um, track them because that's what you need to do to find out where you're at. Also, to another rule, the fourth rule that I have is numbers need to be tracked on a regular basis to be of any use. Um, you can't do this for three months, stop, and figure everything's going to be okay. They've got to be tracked on a regular basis. I prefer monthly. And I prefer they be posted. I know a lot of dentists out there are going to have some problems with some of the numbers we're talking about being uh, known to all members of their team. But I will tell you, if you're really serious about being a profitable practice, you have to kind of understand that, that these numbers need to be known by everybody involved in order to be something that 
you can look at your given situation and improve upon it. And lastly, if you're not going to use a number, don't track it. Um, this was uh, this is illustrated by a story I had, and it's a real brief one. But uh, one office I was called into uh, to, to help with, particularly about um, the process of their day-to-day, -day, you know, work in dentistry. Um, so I sat in when the first couple of days on these morning huddles they had. And if you're not having morning huddles, I think it's beneficial to you to have them. But if you're having a morning huddle, a morning huddle should be focused on what's going to happen that day. In other words, how are you going to take, you know, take care of your patients that day? In other words, if you have um, the morning huddle and you should be talking about, okay, for, for recall or for emergency calls, excuse me, but emergency calls, and wants to get in, where should we put them to create the least amount of disruption to our schedule? Um, you should talk about the fact that when you confirmed Mrs. Smith yesterday, she said she was very worried about her appointment today, it was actually very scary. Um, if you know of a patient who had a crown prep last week and is coming back in or two weeks ago for the cement, and you were aware that he's still in pain, those are the kinds of things to talk about, the things that will make your day better by knowing, by the team team knowing. This particular practice was tracking 43 items. They talked about all 43 or virtually all 43 at every morning huddle. They were having a 30, 40 minute morning huddle and they were never getting to what I think was the important thing. So that's a way of illustrating, if you're not gonna use a number, don't track it. So as we start talking about numbers, I think it's important that we should get over any bias we feel about talking about profit. Um, in my generation, particularly, uh, profit was considered a four-letter word. It was it was a bad thing. You didn't consider profit. You did a good job for your patients, and if you did a good job for your patients, the office was compensated well, and everything was fine. It's not that simple anymore. You need to be aware of what's going on as you go through the process to become profitable. But I'm going to illustrate a point that profit is like winning in sports. It's if you're winning, everything is better. If you're a profitable dental office, everything is better. Patients seem to be happier. Dentists are happier. Staff is happier. And I'm going to illustrate this with my CYO baseball story. And it's something that I use a lot because I think it's, it's very analogous to a dental practice. I coached baseball for a long, long time. And in 2009, I had a seventh and eighth grade CYO baseball team who had a good group of kids. They were predominantly seven creators and we were good, but we weren't great. Our record was eight and seven. And I gotta tell you, I got all kinds of complaints from parents. My son should be playing third base. Why aren't you pitching my son more innings? Um, you know, he's batting eighth. Why isn't he batting fourth? And I had a rule that you couldn't talk to me 24 hours before a game or 24 hours after a game about your son. It still was really, really terrible. It was one of the worst years I had as far as complaints go. The next year, 2010, we had predominantly the same team. These seventh graders have become eighth graders, and any of you with kids know that sometimes a year can make a huge difference in how they grow. These are still really good kids. As a matter of fact, they were great kids. I had five of these kids went on to play Division One baseball in college. But we were the best team in CYO. We beat 128 other teams. We were the CYO champs. We were 17-0. and And it was strange. I had absolutely no complaints. Nobody said... Why wasn't my son playing more? Why should he, you know, he should be pitching instead of this? Not a single complaint. And that's when I like, I think dental practices are a lot the same way. When you're winning, when you're doing well, a lot of the little things just seem to work themselves out. When you're doing poorly, if you're not profitable, a lot of the little stuff becomes major problems. So profit is important in a dental practice. And also too, you need to understand that if you're in practice and you're not making a profit, you're not going to have a practice for very long. As I said before, one of my spoiler alerts was I'd like to see practices be 40% profitable. Um, so 40 cents of every dollar is profit. And we need to understand that profit is not a four letter word. As I said, all stakeholders in a dental practice, patients, doctors, and staff benefit when a profit is higher. We don't have time to go into all the psychological reasons of this, but I can tell you after consulting for with many, many practices over the years. It is true. When practices are profitable, a lot of the other problems go away. So what are the numbers that you should be tracking in your individual practice? Uh, what are the numbers that are unique to you and are going to be in the most importance to you? 
And as I said, before we start, let's make sure we understand these are guidelines. I'm going to give you a list of numbers I think you should be tracking. Their different practices may have different numbers and different guidelines of different practices, but it's a great place to start. This is a one hour seminar. We don't have time to talk about every little nuance about this whole process of profitability and how it affects dental practices, but this is a good place to start. So I like to start this process or this part with a quote from Albert Einstein. And it's very apropos when it comes to dental practice. Not everything can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. In other words, there are things you can't count, you can't reduce to a number. For example, I'm gonna talk about some numbers here in a minute that when put together will give you roughly a good idea of how happy your patients are with you, with you as a practice. But you can't count that exact number. You can't say, okay, how many of our patients are happy? But you can get it by, by coupling together some other numbers. And as I stated with my story about the 43 different things that were being tracked, not everything that can be counted counts. There's a lot of things that you can count that are not necessary to count. You need to count the things that are important to you and your practice. So what numbers are important to track and why are they important? Again, it's going to be slightly different for different practices, but I want to make sure that we get to the point or understand that um, there is a basic set to start with. And these are my basic set. I think you need to track practice collection, not production, but collection. We'll talk about that more in a minute but you need to track collection. You need to track practice expenses, both as an entire category of total expenses, as I said, for my 40% number, but you also need to track them by category, staff costs, facility costs, lab costs, dental supply costs, and administrative costs, basically everything else. In addition, I think you should be tracking the total number of active patients you have, and as well as the total number of patients due for recall, but are not scheduled. We're gonna talk more about these all individually, but again, and to finish out the, the rough set of numbers, I think you can track things the total number of new patients. So I'm gonna to explain to you here in a moment the interplay of these numbers, but that's your basic set of numbers that you should be tracking. First, practice collection. I'm often asked, why not production? Because I will tell you that the in today's day and age in most practices collecting all the money that's collectible is not typically a problem i see in other words the difference between collection and production is going to vary by based on the office you have if you're an office that is a non-par you know if you don't participate with insurance and you're 100 fee for service i would gather that your collection percentage is going to be 99 percent of what you produce and that's understandable. But if you're an office who has a provider, a dentist who is a non-Delta Premier provider, and you accept a lot of PPOs, that production versus collection number might be 81% or 82%. The decision of whether to accept those plans, a non-full fee service plan, is a philosophical discussion that has to be had at the level of practice owner. Do you want to participate or not? And there's a ton of factors that go into this. I spent yesterday with an office that's deciding to go non-par with insurance. Very unique set of circumstances. I typically do not recommend that. That is a tough way to go in today's environment. Some discussion and evaluation of which plan is good and which plan is not good is something I think that is, is, is important, but is not something that should be tracked by the staff or, or by the practice to, on a month-to-month -month basis. It should be a philosophical discussion that's had on a year-to-year basis. So as we talk about that, I'm often asked, does collection percentage matter? Collection percentage matters, but only in the, in the sense that you discuss adjusted production versus collection. Adjusted production is, any of you who are front desk people know this, when you get an EOB back and there's something has to be written off, there's various ways to do that. There's what I call a production write-off or a collection write-off. A production write-off is if you are a Delta Premier provider, um, Delta PPO provider, and you charge a thousand dollars for a crown, and you're going to get seven hundred dollars back, you're going to have to write off the three hundred dollar difference. That's going to be written off as a production write-off. It's not because you couldn't collect the money. It's because you couldn't charge the amount of money. You couldn't, couldn't charge the full fee. 
versus a collection write-off is if you charge $1,000 for a crown and you were non-participating and the patient only paid you $700 and you couldn't collect the $300, that would be a collection write-off. So adjusted production is basically write-offs after, I'm sorry, is collection or is, is production after you've written off all the production write-offs. hope that makes sense. It's a, it's a subtle point, but it's very, very important. So what is a good number for each of your expense categories? As I said, I think the overall number should be 40%. I'm going to give you some norms here. And, and again, the same disclaimer we talked about. It's not so important about the individual numbers as much as you kind of understand where you fit in here. In a normal practice, a, a practice that is doing traditionally bread and butter dentistry, the normal amount of crown and bridge, these numbers hold true to get to your 40% uh, profitability number. Staff cost should be between 25 and 30 percent of collections. Facility cost should be between five and nine percent of practice collections. Lab cost should be between five and eight percent of practice collections. Dental supply cost should be between four and six percent of practice collections. Administrative cost should be between five and seven percent of practice collections. We're going to talk more about these each individually, but these again are the broad ranges of the categories when you're starting to think about um, what you, you know, what you should be as a practice. All right, let's talk about staff costs. As I said, I think they should be between 25 and 30 percent of office collections is a general rule. These things are going to vary. We'll talk a little bit about how they could possibly vary, but before we start, a bigger word of caution. Uh, usually when I'm talking about this, I see team members be very, very concerned about you know discussing the the staff salaries and what they should be they tend to think more in terms of absolutes in other words it's rather a percentage of collections but the main thing here i want to get across is that when i see this kind of problem when i see staff costs being too high if i see staff costs at 41 percent of collections it's not usually due to the staff being overpaid as a matter of fact it's almost universally not due to the staff being overpaid what it's due to is the office is underproducing, the underproduction of the office. I know that's kind of a, a difficult concept to get right now. We're going to talk about it, but it's not a staff problem. So as a staff member, don't automatically recoil from the idea of tracking what your staff costs are. So let's talk about some of the particulars about staff costs. What should be included in staff costs in my world, in my definition? Everything. The staff payroll, um, the unemployment insurance. The any staff benefits, even the Christmas party should be included in the staff costs. And I'm often asked more by dentists, what do you do if staff costs are too high? What to do about it? Well, the first thing to do is to check over what I discussed earlier about the underproduction. And a good way to check that is there are some norms and you should check your hygiene collection versus your doctor collection to determine if underproduction is the problem. You can see here where I said hygiene collections should be no more than one third of total collections. I regret saying no more, uh, but I like to see hygiene collections roughly at about one third of the total collection. So if you're collecting $100,000, I'd like to see hygiene be $33,000, $33,333 of that, where doctor collection is $66,666. And again, it's a rough rule of thumb but it's a good one. If you see that your hygiene uh, collection is too low, that is an issue. That means you've got a high producing doctor and maybe you're a very high crown and bridge practice or you're doing a ton of um, full mouth reconstruction, in which case that's predominantly what you're doing. Um, but if you see that you're what I usually see is hygiene collection being more than one third of total collections. And what that indicates to me as a practice consultant is that the dentist is probably under treatment planning. I can hear the howls and complaints out there from dentists who are listening to this. No, I treatment plan what's there. Well, I tell you is yes, you do. But I will tell you what I have seen, the more mature a practice is, the more conservative a dentist typically gets in their treatment plan. Uh, the more mature a practice is, the more the dentist says, you know, that's Mary Smith. She's tough to work on. She needs a crown on 15. I don't want to do the crown on 15. Let's just watch that. That'll be something for later. And that's okay. I mean, if that philosophically is what you decide as a practice or as a practice owner, 
that you're going to be more conservative on that. And I have to tell you, you're talking to somebody who was. My last 10 years of practice, I became extremely conservative, so much so that when I turned my practice over to my associate, he doubled it in the first year. And he was a PPO provider. I mean, I just was under treatment plan. One of the nice things about being a dentist is you get to pick and choose. And I'm not saying you're doing something that's bad for the patient. You just tend to be less aggressive. And that's okay. But you should use these norms to kind of value where you're at. So, for example, if you were like me and you were 60 years old, my hygiene was about 44% of what I collected. And I was, and because of that, my staff costs were higher than 30%. They were in the 33, 34% range. I was fine with that. You just need to know what the numbers are so you can evaluate where you're at and if you're willing to accept that. It will affect your profitability or it may affect your profitability. But if you understand where you fit and you make that determination, hey, that's fine with me, great. I'm often asked, what if staff costs are too low? I have to tell you, I don't usually see this, but if I do, and I have run across it over the years, it's usually indicative to me that staffs are being underpaid. Um, again, the dentists out there probably don't like to hear this. You're going to hear me pick on dentists a lot today. Um, I feel it's okay for me to do that because I am one. But um, if your staff costs are too low, that probably means you're not, as a dentist, you're not paying what you need to be to be competitive in the marketplace today. So it is something that you should consider and look at. Facility costs. I believe they should be between 5 and 9% of office collections. I'm often asked what's included in facility costs. The same thing as staff costs, everything. Your rent, your mortgage payment, if you have one. Um, if you don't have a mortgage payment, if the dentist owns the office and is not paying themselves rent, then you should be including a figure, a number in there when you're evaluating your profitability, at least for, to evaluate profitability for the market rate of rent. You should include the property tax. The triple maintenance costs or the, the, the triple net costs that go with if you're renting a space, the snow removal, the garbage removal, even the cleaning crew. I think that should all go into the facility costs. And what are the reasons the facility costs are too high? I really see those in two camps. And I do see that quite often. Usually they're less mature practices who are just kind of getting started. They're in a brand new space, a really desirable location with either a high rent or a high cost to build out the building. That's one reason. The second reason is that they just, it, it's its mostly for dentists that just got in a little too far over their head. They have too much space. They have a 10 operatory practice that at one time they were a bigger office and they needed 10 ops, although that's extremely a lot of ops. Uh, but that cost is too high. The more space you have, the more it's going to cost you. It's just, it is sort of this cosmic reality. If you have eight ops, you're going to have eight ops worth of expenses. If you have two ops, you're going to have two ops worth of expenses. It just tends to work that way. So trust me on that. But uh, the two reasons for facility costs being too high are a young practice getting started or a dentist getting into a space that's either too large or too high priced for what they're doing. And what to do if facility costs are too high? I've got to tell you, for the most part, there's not a lot you can do. Um, I've seen situations where, and when I just consulted on just recently, where the dentist had a cleaning crew coming in seven days a week, but they only work three days. I mean, you can nibble around the edges and, 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 and shave off a half a percentage point. But if your facility costs are too high, that's tough to fix. It's very expensive to move. Um, it's very expensive to do the things you need to do to fix that. Most places, you're not going to be able to go from 10 ops to four ops to right size yourself. So facility costs are a tough one. Fortunately, it's not a huge factor in most practices. If you get to a certain production level, um, you can justify the cost. I will also tell you that all your costs, costs get better if you're collecting more. Obviously, you're taking these as a percentage of collections. Most offices are functioning way below their capacity and their ability to see patients, particularly on the doctor side of things. The doctor can always do more dentistry. If you do that more dentistry, your, your, your expenses get way more in line with the numbers we're talking about. All right, lab costs should be five to 8% of practice collections. I see problems in this area a fair amount of the time, but not typically. Um, what are the reasons for too high lab costs? Almost universally, when I see too high lab costs, it's a, it's a doctor problem. The doctor believes they can only get quality by paying $400 a unit for the crowns. Um, what I will say is that 
in, when I've when I've seen this, uh, one of the things that I do is kind of strikes to what do you do about too high lab costs? You start exploring. You you get the doctor for the staff member, and you're talking to the doctor about this. Have them start to look at maybe some possible other labs. Um, I've even done things where we've gone to labs and visited them to see the kind of quality they're putting out to kind of make it the dentist aware that there are other alternatives. They don't. They're not strapped. They're not tasked with having to have all these high costs no matter what. And I think you need to take into account milling machines. If you have a CEREC or things like that, I see lab costs being very low. Um, and that's okay, and that's very good, but you need to be aware that they may be falsely low because you have a CEREC. And if that's the case, what I suggest you do is put the CEREC supplies, the milling blocks, um, any other supplies you use with regards to the CEREC machine out of your supply bill and into your lab costs to get a true test or a true evaluation of how you're doing as a practice. And is there such a thing as too low lab costs? I've got to tell you, there probably is. I don't see that very often. I think that's another kind of telling point that maybe you're not treatment planning as aggressively as you should be. If you, for example, don't have a CEREC and your lab costs are 2%, that probably means you're not treatment planning the high-end services that are needed. And just a word about this whole concept of underproduction. As I said, I know dentists, it's a very delicate subject and I'm sensitive to it too. When I had to evaluate myself and said, hey, you're not being aggressive enough. People are people. People in Birmingham don't necessarily or probably or don't really need more crown or bridge than people in Detroit or in the inner city. They kind of need the same amount. So these numbers do kind of equate no matter what your geographic area is. Area is. Now you may find that people in Detroit are much less accepting of Crown and Bridge than the people in Birmingham, which may alter the numbers, but not a difference between 2% and 17%. So keep in mind that again, when you fall outside these numbers, a lot of the problems I see are dentist or, or mental or, phys or psychological in nature rather than physical in nature from the standpoint of the right type of patients. Dental supply costs should be between four and 6%. This is one that I see a lot and is a big problem. And is, again, it's almost 100% because of the dentist. The number one reason that dental supply costs are too high are because of the dentist. And again, I can make fun, poke fun at dentists because I'm one of them. But when I say they're because of the dentist, they're because the dentist wants the newest and greatest. And, you know, the supply rep comes in and says, you know, I have this new cementation kit. It's fantastic. It's $1,200. Yeah, put that on our bill. Great, buy it. You'll know if you're that type of practice because you'll go into your back office and you're going to look through your supplies and you're going to see eight cementation kits. You're going to see 17 different types of composites. You're going to see a bunch of unused burrs that are no longer uh, used by the dentist, all kinds of gadgetry of how to get crowns off without, you know, without destroying the crown, all kinds of things along those lines. So we're our own worst enemy. So what I advise when you have supply costs that are too high is, first of all, you got to take the dentist out of the equation. And the easiest way to do that, in my view, is have a supply budget. You have a monthly supply budget. So if you set your goal at 6% of collections for supplies, and you're doing a million dollars worth of dentistry, you're collecting a million dollars a year, that means you can afford 6% of that or $60,000. I don't want to get too math oriented for you, but 6% of a million is 60. If you take that $60,000, divide it by 12 months, that's $5,000 a month. So your supply budget, which is in my world or my desire for you, is cannot be violated is $5,000 a month. If you're gonna go over that, it needs to be an act of Congress. There has to be a really good reason for it. It can't be something you're violating every month. You also have to have a single staff member. Notice I said not dentist, staff member in charge of ordering supplies. And they have to be tasked with staying within their budget. And I will tell you that when this works the best, even the dentist can't supersede that staff member. You have to pick the right person. You have to find somebody who's interested in doing this. Um, there probably has to be a little incentive for them for doing this, but you have to put them in charge and have a budget. And this is what we're going to do when we're going to do it. And we're not going to, no matter what, if you get a great deal on uh, impression material, if you're still using impression material and, you know, you can buy 17 years worth of it, it doesn't matter. Unless it's in the budget, you cannot do that. 
And as I said, I think the easiest way to do this is to keep the dentist away from the supply reps. Or if they're intent on talking to supply reps, they can't order. That'll discourage supply reps real quick. I mean, they're not interested in talking to the person you can't order. So if you, and also if your dentist goes to the midwinter meetings or, or you know goes to the MBA convention or the annual session, you know they have to go there and they have to take the supply person in tow, and they can't order unless he or she says it's okay. I'm sort of joking here, but this is easily correctable. I would say the practice I own in Burton, we saved one hundred fifty thousand dollars the first year after I became co-owner was because we were spending 14% of our um, collections on supplies. And all I did was, actually, I never did get it down to six. I got it down to seven. But it was a huge benefit just instituting a couple of these small changes. Administrative costs. Administrative costs are kind of the junk drawer of practice expenses. They're everything that doesn't go somewhere else. And when I say this kind of stuff and administrative costs, I'm talking about office insurance, office supplies, all other legit expenses of running a dental practice. I'm going to talk about this in a moment because if you're going to play in this pond, if you're going to evaluate your expenses and your profit, there's kind of an elephant in the room. But basically, administrative costs are everything that doesn't go somewhere else. And let's talk about that elephant in the room. And it's what I like to call soft expenses. And this is a real nebulous and subtle distinction. And it's something that all of us practice owners know. There are certain things that are deductible on your tax return, but are not really what I would call legitimate costs with running an office. For example, um, the doctor's salary, an associate's salary. Obviously, those are deductible on a tax return, depending upon what entity you are. It's outside the scope of our discussion here today. But uh, for example, if you're a corporation, the doctor's going to be paid a salary, that's deductible. That's tax deductible. The associate's going to be paid a salary and paid like an employee. That's deductible. But those are really not what I would consider true expenses. That, in other words, that 40% number would only hold if you take all the doctor-related expenses out. So doctor benefits, doctor life insurance, doctor disability, not malpractice insurance, but basically things that are not necessary for the practice to grow. If there's continuing education, um, deduction taken because the, 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 the dentist likes to go to Turks and Caicos and take their continuing education rather than going to the MBA. Great. That's fine. It's tax deductible. I have no problem with that. But you need to separate that out when you're evaluating how you're doing as a practice from a profitability standpoint. A lot of doctors use their credit cards for non-practice costs. Okay. I'm not here to make a moral judgment on whether that should be reported to the IRS or anything like that. I'm never going to tell the IRS any of that type of thing, but you need to understand that that should be taken off your legitimate practice expenses. Doctor's car payment, or sometimes non-doctor related expenses can fit in here, like depreciation. And um, how can you tell if an expense is hard or soft? I will tell you, it's easy because you're going to know it. And as a way of illustrating that, I'm going to tell you my $40,000 plastic surgery expense story. I, I consulted the fall last year with a practice that was, um, you know, having some issues with regarding profitability and it's actually for a sale. And I was going through the practice expenses and I saw a $40,000 expense to a certain doctor. And I said, what's going on here? And she said, well, that was a plastic surgery procedure I had. Fine. If you feel like you can write that off in your taxes, great. Just understand that that's not a legitimate practice expense. So, once you get through the expenses and the collection, there's a couple other things you should track. Total number of active patients. And I'm going to be very harsh here on what an active patient actually is. In my world, an active patient is a patient on recall. I'll explain that more why that's important, but it's an easy number to track. Everybody says, well, geez, I've got 2,000 active patients, 20,000 on recall. In my definition, you have 1,000 active patients. And you need to track this over time because if you do, it's going to tell you whether you, whether you have more patients in your practice or less. And what do you do if the number's declining? You need to look at it, evaluate it. What's going on? How many new patients are we getting? Um, are, if we're getting 40 new patients a month and our active patients numbers are declining, that means we're driving 40% to 40 patients a month away or they're leaving for whatever their reasons. What do you do if the number is growing? Again, that's going to let you know that maybe you need to think about, do we need to add more hygiene? Do we need to add more capacity to our doctor's schedule? Another number you should be tracking is the total number of patients on recall that are not scheduled. Why is this number significant? 
Well, first of all, because without hygiene, you eventually end up with an emergencies only practice. Emergencies only practice are neither fun nor profitable. Anybody who's worked in a fair amount of practices over the years knows what I'm talking about. Uh, these are not long-term patients. They're not patients you develop long-term relationships with, which is one of the best things about dentistry. So you need to have hygiene. But in order to have a healthy hygiene department, you need to know how many number, how many patients you have on recall that are not scheduled. And you need to know, use this number to determine how well you're doing as a practice. So what do you do if the number of non-scheduled recall patients is increasing? What that tells you is, is you don't have enough hygiene capacity. Now, what you do about that and how you handle that is going to be up to you, but there are things we can talk about. Okay, do you add days of hygiene? Do you not? Um, are you willing to risk patients leaving because they can't get in? But you need to know that number. And if you add hygiene days, this is a problem that I see a lot in practices when they say, geez, we're going to add hygiene days, but we're really worried if we have openings in the hygiene schedule. Our, our, our dentist just absolutely hates it when we have openings in the hygiene schedule. That's understandable. You have to get over that. If you're going to add hygiene days, you're going to have openings in the schedule, particularly initially. That is going to happen no matter what you do. And I have a story to kind of illustrate that point. And, and I was called by this practice that said, we have 2,000 patients on a recall, but we can only keep one full-time hygienist busy. Just again, another rule of thumb, basically a full-time hygienist, 32 hours a week, four eight-hour days, can handle 1,000 recall patients. That's actually a little high for today, in today's type of dentistry, but it's something to think about. So this practice said they had 2,000 recall patients, so they only keep one full-time hygienist busy. They just couldn't possibly add any more days. And when I looked at it and I, we started tracking it, they, had, they did have 2,000 active patients on recall, but only 975 of those patients were scheduled for recall. So almost half the practice was not scheduled. And when I asked some questions, the reasons became very apparent. And when I talked with the front desk staff, they said, look, our dentist just absolutely, it ruins her day if she has an opening in the hygiene schedule. She is, is upset. I mean, we're paying this hygienist. We're paying you know, Mary to, to sit there and do nothing. I don't want any opening. So what this front desk staff, in order to accommodate this dentist, had done is they had developed a huge long list of people they could meet I mean, it took four months to get into this practice for scaling and roof lining because they didn't have any openings. But because that dentist was so ultra sensitive to any breaks in the schedule, they absolutely insisted on there being no opening. So what we did is we worked on the mindset of the dentist, the practice owner, and the team too, to say, hey, if you have some openings, that wasn't important. And what we did is we decided that instead of tracking hygiene openings or things like that, we would track the overall practice collection and the overall practice um, profitability. And those became our numbers rather than how filled the hygiene schedule was. And in six months, we had four days of hygiene. We, they did have 2,000 patients. They needed two full-time hygiene. So we had four full days of hygiene and we increased the practice profit 40%. It was merely by tracking this number in particular, uh, knowing how many patients were active or were, were unrecalled but not scheduled. You should also, and lastly, be tracking the number of new patients. I'm going to show you in a moment a story how we put all these numbers together, but why are new patients important? Because no matter how great of a practice we are, people are going to leave. They move. They die. Their insurances change. Things happen. So we do have to continually be replenishing our practice. So you need to know how many new patients you're getting. Uh, and, and when you couple that with some of your other numbers, how many patients, active patients you have, and how many patients you have on recall that are not scheduled, you get a pretty good view of what your practice is, is doing. And I'm often asked, what's the right number of new patients to have? And it varies. It varies wildly. If you're a practice that wants to grow, you want to double in size in two years, you may need 50 new patients a month. If you're a practice that's very happy where you're at and you, you want to stay there, then maybe all you need are 10 new patients a month, but you do need to track it so you know um, where you're at and, and what, what the practice is doing, whether it's increasing or decreasing over time. More importantly, or not more importantly, but as importantly as you should track where those new patients are coming from. If you do any advertising, they're coming from advertising. If it's all word of mouth, you, know, you should track whether it's word of mouth, but you should know. What are you going to do with your numbers once you have them? What are you going to do if they're not good? Again, as I said, good or not good is relative. It's not necessarily 
not necessarily something that for one practice is a good number for in other words, what may be a great number for one practice, 20 new patients a month. If you need 50, it's not a good number. So make sure you understand what's going on and you need to know, are you actually have a problem or is this really what you want? And I'm going to tell you um, this having to do with the practice that I mentioned earlier, I believe I mentioned earlier, the practice that wants to go non par with insurance is, is we, I was initially called in because they said, you know, we just don't have any room to put any hygiene patients. We're just overwhelmed. You know, it's four months, actually it's five months to get a recall appointment. They, have, they didn't have room for new patients. They were talking about not taking new patients. And they said, we got a problem. We want to know what to do about it. As I got in and we started talking about it, um, we were really went back and we were able to look. The number of active patients that were not scheduled was exploding. They were right. And when I asked them what they what their goals were, they said, you know, really, and this doesn't happen very often, I have to admit, this particular practice said we really would like less patients. So after I questioned them about 42 different times to make sure that's what they were what they were saying was true, they really wanted to slow down. So what we decided on instead of adding another day of hygiene, which they didn't want to do, they had two full-time hygienists per dentist every day. They didn't want to go to three per dentist per day. Uh, they felt that that would just be further stressful. What we decided to do was to go non par with insurance. Now it's a long drawn out process. It's going to take some time, but we'll, we'll get there. But going non par with insurance is going to restrict their schedule to having, in other words, patients are going to leave. So basically, they thought they had a problem until we really thought about it. Going non-par was actually going to solve their problem. It wasn't really a problem. So when you look at your numbers, make sure you've got a problem. So once you decide you do have a problem, you need to do several things. You got to clarify your goals and make sure you know what you really want, what you're trying to achieve. You need to decide what your numbers need to, need to be to in order to achieve that goal. You need to decide what steps you can take to improve your numbers that will help your goals. In other words, you got to develop a plan. A plan for the number improvement. You got to have somebody in charge of the change changes. Somebody or the improvement. Somebody has to be responsible. You've got to ask somebody. Be able to ask somebody how are we doing. You got to monitor this progress on a regular basis, and you need to alter the plan as needed as you go. And this is an example of the right way to do this. Once you have all your numbers, and this is a story. You know, we need more hygiene saga. I was asked to come in and help because this dentist said, "Geez, we need more hygiene." We're having a problem because we don't have enough hygiene patients. I don't have enough patients to treatment plan. Um, I don't have enough patients to treatment plan. We're not doing as much dentistry as we should. So when I was called in, um, we started tracking the total number of patients on recall that were not scheduled. We tracked this. We were able to go back a few months, but we basically tracked it over a six-month period. And what we found is this particular practice had 1,200 patients on recall, but only seven practices were from three days a week. Only 700 of those patients were scheduled, 500 patients were on recall, but not scheduled. And there were a variety of reasons. Um, again, the dentists really hated the fact that there was any openings in hygiene, but largely it was because this is just the way it evolved. They'd always had one full-time hygienist, one hygienist three days a week. They hadn't really thought about adding another one and the practice had grown. So we had an office meeting and it was, we decided we kind of got everybody involved, the entire practice, the team and everybody else to agree that what we wanted to do was improve this to get us to 75% of the patients that were on recall schedule. So we looked at the recall program, we changed it, we assigned a dedicated recall coordinator, which I can tell you another little tidbit works absolutely fantastic. If you want to clean up your recall program, have somebody dedicated to keeping that recall schedule full and in charge of it. But we got a dedicated recall coordinator. In 12 months, we were seeing 78% of the recall patients that were scheduled. The practice collections were up $150,000. In this case, it was roughly 20, I think 24, 25%. And the practice profit was up almost $100,000. This is an example of using your numbers and then changing your practice, using your numbers to change your practice for the better for yourself. So now that you know what your numbers are, um, have a direct bearing. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I went the wrong way. Oh, I'm sorry. So you need to develop. My bad. Um, we need to take your numbers and develop and clarify your goals as a practice. What do you want to do? You need to do this in conjunction with your practice owner, but also with your team. You need everybody on your team involved in this. You need to decide what aspect of your practice needs improvement 
and a warning. Don't take on too much. Uh, a lot of times when I talk to practices, they want to do seven different things at once. It's just not possible. Pick something you want to improve. Occasionally, you'll do your numbers. You find out, hey, we're not bad. We're doing pretty well. What we want to do is maintain. That's okay, too. You need to decide what numbers you should be tracking to achieve your practice goals. You should start to track them and post the results. Again, I said you need to post the results. Uh, that may be uncomfortable for some people, but you don't get the benefit of tracking numbers unless you post them. You need to have regular meetings, both with the practice owner and the team, to monitor your progress. You need to alter your plan as you go if the results are not what you want them to be. And then you need to reap the rewards of success. I think it's important that you celebrate your successes.